Oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, Lord, I want to be in the number when the saints go marching in. And when the sun begins to shine, Oh, when the sun begins to shine, oh Lord, I want to be in the number when the sun begins to shine. Oh, when the trumpet sounds its call, oh, when the trumpet sounds its call, Lord, how I want to be in the number when the trumpet sounds its call. Some say this world of trouble is, is the only one we need. But I'm waiting for that morning when the new world is revealed. Oh Lord, I want to be in the number. When the I'm often struck by, you know, the, the command that we get in John's gospel that we always gets read sometime, you know, during the Easter season, when Jesus commands people to love one another. Gee whiz, you know, fickle demand to love one another. I mean, this is probably not much different from blessed of the peacemakers in a sense. And I, it always strikes me that the, that the only answer I could ever come up with to the command to love one another, I, you know, I, I can't turn my heart around in, in the course of just having a sort of moral exhortation from Jesus to be a better person, but I can actually go and do some of the stuff that I would do if I loved them. We at least know what it is if we were the kinds of people that we, we were supposed to be. This is very clear, I think. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapters 10 and 11, are, are really powerfully Eucharistic. Sometimes we get lost under the details of what he was arguing with with the Corinthians, that if we believe with Paul that we're constituted as the body of Christ in the Eucharist, then there's also a horizontal dimension to that capacity to, to rely upon the reality that we don't experience. That's to say, sometimes we're carried along by the other members of the community as the body of Christ, you know, and in our worship and in other respects as well. If, if we take Paul seriously, not only is the Eucharist the body of Christ, but so too the church is the body. And so in discipleship, in worship, in peacemaking, we're all actually drawn into the activity of the whole. I think he, he, he really does mean that we are, you know, we who are many are one body for your share in the one bread, that we've actually been constituted as members of a body of which Christ is the head. Another reason, at least, why the example of a, of a Martin Luther King or, or whomever else we might choose among the saints is, is inspiring to us, not only because they are moral examples from whom we can learn, but because we actually believe there's a sense in which our lives are bound up with theirs in Christ. You know, that, that what has happened to them has in some sense happened to us because all of that has happened in what has happened to Christ. You know, I'm interested in early Christianity. And so Martin, who's a fourth century saint, was someone I was acquainted with. But I had uh, maybe a, a bit of a, a, a revelatory moment or a spiritual moment in um, this, uh, November of 2016 uh, on St. Martin's Day. St. Martin's Day falls on November the 11th, which, you know, we otherwise know as Veterans Day in this country or previously Armistice Day. And uh, that was a few days after the election of 2016. I found myself in really wrestling inwardly uh, with the aftermath of that election, not only because I personally, I, I couldn't deny that I found the outcome so disturbing. I'm a foreigner, of course, so I'm, uh, I'm not a US citizen or, or a voter. And 
I'm always conscious of being a, a guest who has been wonderfully and hospitably welcomed and received in this country. But I'm sometimes a bit concerned about how, just as it's very obvious that, that Christianity has been weaponized by elements of the far right in this country, that in a subtler way uh, that progressive Christians are sometimes wrapping themselves in the flag in a way which doesn't actually strike me as being citizens of a different country and so forth. Martin's story is interesting because he lives during this time when Christianity is coming to terms with its newfound status as the sort of endorsed Roman state religion. And of course, we've been living with the consequences of that ever since. There are a couple of stories about Martin with, with mentioning, but which I think exemplify the fact that he is someone who is negotiating that process of how to live in a society which claims the trappings of Christianity, but which cannot be allowed to get away with it. Uh, there's, there's the famous story of Martin when he was still a catechumen, uh, that's to say before he was baptized. He was a Roman officer, uh, a Roman cavalry officer. Uh, he was going into the, the, the gate to the city and there was a, a beggar sitting next to the, the gate of the city and Martin divided his cloak with him. And this is famously depicted in many works of art, Martin taking this great equestrian soldier's cloak and cutting it in half and giving it to the beggar. And then uh, according to Martin's biography, he had a dream that night in which Christ appeared wearing the half cloak that had been given to the beggar and speaking to the angels and saying to the angels, look, Martin, who is only a catechumen has given me his cloak. So, you know, Martin, who was not even yet a baptized Christian was, was acting in such a way as to see the presence of Christ among the poorest uh, along the lines of, you know, the great parable of the judgment in Matthew's gospel. But Martin, um, Martin sought baptism he became a hermit and, and as often seems to happen in the fourth century, when you become a holy man and a hermit, you try and hide away, people come after you and they want to make you a bishop. But Martin got dragged into the town and made the Bishop of Tours against his will and he became a, a, a great and holy bishop. And there's one other story about him that I think is just worth mentioning. There was a, a heretical upsurge uh, in Spain. Uh, there was a, a bishop of Avila, the same place that you know, Teresa is famous for a century, a mille millennium later. And this bishop named Priscillian was a heretic, heretical bishop who was sort of engaging in various sort of Gnostic and magical kinds of uh, activities. And some of the other bishops not only deposed him, which was probably their right and appropriate action, but they thought, oh, well, we've got the Roman Empire on our side now. Let's use the, the coercive power of the civil law in order to enforce orthodoxy in the church. And they did this to the point that Priscillian was tried for heresy in the civil court and executed. And uh, Martin excommunicated all the bishops who were involved in the process of taking Priscillian's life. He had no sympathy whatsoever with Priscillian's heresy, but he understood, and this circles back to his giving up his soldiery, he understood that the Christian church could have no truck with the use of civil power in a coercive fashion, let alone to perform violence. So Martin strikes me as someone who is a a model for us of how to renegotiate the possibility of a Christian public witness while understanding the difference between what Christian public witness would be and the interests of the state in which we live. Oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, Lord, I want to be in the number when the saints go marching in. And when the sun begins to shine, oh, when the sun begins to shine, oh, Lord, I want to be in the number when the sun begins to shine. Oh, when the trumpet sounds its call. Oh, when the trumpet sounds its call. Lord, how I want to be in that number. When the trumpet sounds its call. Some say this world of trouble is, is the only one we 